October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. By definition, domestic violence is the willful intimidation, physical assault, battery, sexual assault, and or other abusive behavior that is part of a systemic pattern of power and control perpetrated by one partner against another. It includes physical violence, sexual violence, threats, and emotional abuse, and the frequency and severity of domestic violence can vary dramatically. I'm going to use reports from the American Association of Christian Counselors and a lot of um, data from Safe Resource. Every minute, nearly 20 people are physically abused by an intimate partner in the United States. It was a huge problem before COVID, but data from the front lines show that all types of violence, particularly domestic violence, have intensified with COVID and it's being called the shadow pandemic. Police departments from around the country are reporting increased calls about domestic violence starting with the month of the lockdown. It has increased ever since in cities all around the country. And according to the Journal of Emergency Medicine, domestic violence related calls have increased by 10% in New York City, 18% in San Antonio, Texas, 22% in Portland, Oregon, 27% in Jefferson County, Alabama. Domestic violence hotlines have reflected an increase as well. In Illinois, calls to the state's hotline increased by 16% in 2020. The text messages have, for help have skyrocketed from 37 in 2019 to 936 in 2020. However, other hotlines have seen a decrease in calls and they believe that is because domestic violence has caused and the lockdown have made it unsafe for people to actually call for help because they don't have the privacy to be able to do so. About one in four women and nearly one in 10 men have experienced contact, with, um, have experienced contact sexual violence, physical violence and or stalking by a partner during their lifetime. Over 43 million women and 38 million men have experienced psychological aggression by a partner in their lifetime. And when intimate partner violence occurs in adolescence, it's called teen dating violence, and that affects millions of United States teens every year. About 11 million women and 5 million men who reported experiencing contact, sexual violence, physical violence, or stalking by their partner in a lifetime say that they first experienced these forms of violence before the age of 18. Intimate partner violence is a significant public health issue with, his, with many costs to society and an individual. About 35% of female survivors and more than 11% of male survivors experience some form of injury related to this violence. Data from the United States Crime Report suggests that about one in five homicide victims are killed by an intimate partner. And the reports also found that over half of female homicide victims in the United States are killed by a current or former male intimate partner. The lifetime economic costs associated with medical services for um, intimate partner violence related injuries, loss of productivity from paid work, criminal justice and other costs was $3.6 trillion. The cost of intimate partner violence over a victim's lifetime was $103,767 for women and $23,414 for men. Here are some statistics for the state of Minnesota. 33.9% of Minnesota women and 25.1% of Minnesota men experience intimate partner physical violence, intimate partner rape, and or intimate partner stalking in their lifetime. On one day in 2019, 74% of domestic violence programs in Minnesota served 1,975 adult and child survivors. Another 352 requests for services went unmet due to lack of resources. 53% of women experiencing homelessness in Minnesota in 2018 
had stayed in a relationship because they did not have alternate housing available. In 2018, at least 14 people in Minnesota were murdered in domestic violence homicides. In 2018, one third of Minnesota domestic violence homicides were committed with firearms. Between 2006 and 2015, there were 22,760 active orders of protection in the National Crime Information Center for Minnesota. 4,180 of them had a disqualifying Brady indicator, which prohibits possessing a firearm. Domestic violence offenders who are physically abusive towards their intimate partners may often become sexually abusive as well. And victims who are both physically and sexually abused are more likely to be injured or killed than those who experience only one form of the abuse. People of all genders, races, ages, social classes, and ethnicities are as likely to be assaulted by an intimate partner. Women who are disabled, pregnant, or attempting to leave their abusers are at the greatest risk for partner rape. National statistics published by the Center for Disease Control, the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, as well as the FBI, crime statistics report the following. One in five women will be raped in their lifetime. Nearly one in two women and one in five men reported being victimized by a sexually violent predator other than rape at some point in their lives. Intimate partners use sexual assault and rape to intimidate, control, and debase victims and survivors of domestic violence. Intimate partners who commit sexual assault are more likely to cause physical injury than a stranger or a friend. Between 14% and 25% of women are sexually assaulted by intimate partners during the course of their relationship. Between 40 and 45% of women in abusive relationships will also be sexually assaulted during the course of that relationship. More than half of women who are raped by an intimate partner are likely to be sexually assaulted multiple times by the same partner. Women who are sexually abused by intimate partners report more risk factors for intimate partner homicides than non-sexually abused women. Women who are sexually abused by intimate partners suffer severe and long-lasting physical and mental health problems similar to those of other rape victims. These women experience higher rates of depression and anxiety than women who were either raped by a non-intimate partner or physically but not sexually abused by an intimate partner. They report severe trust and intimacy issues. This is a pretty personal subject for me. Um, I was violently assaulted physically and sexually by someone who, who had stalked me for quite some time and it changed my life to this day. I lost my will to live. That person had threatened me that if I told anyone because they had a prominent position in the community and I told them, I wish I was dead. At that moment, I didn't want to live anymore and I, I just was suicidal until the point where I nearly completed a successful suicide at the age of 26 and a half, but for a miracle, I would be dead and in hell right now. The impact of that assault was so great that it's hard to quantify how much of myself was stolen in that moment. God was able to put so much into me at once, I believe, because so much of me was gone. I was, by all, I, I just... I was a dead person after that by most definitions. I just was completely missing. I know the impact of this. It's a wonder I can talk about it, but I'm very, very um, passionate to provide an ear to those who are not being heard and who are suffering in this way. My life is very much a miracle but I am very different as a result of what happened. Even now, I'm very different as a result of that. It has changed who I am in many ways. I am um, a very private and a very 
I, I'm not out in public very much at all. I mean, it's still, it had, had a, quite an impact on my life. So this is personal. And I have uh, renewed PTSD because most of us who have been through things like this have trauma that is hard to get healed and you don't always know where it is and then all of a sudden it gets triggered. And that happened to me a couple years ago um, just by some aggressive bullying that was happening to me in a professional setting. And it triggered my trauma and has left me with quite a series of problems that I can't get under control. So I'm very passionate about this subject. But fortunately for me, I spent a lot of years out in the jails helping men and women and I, I heard the men also. I heard, I heard what they have been through also and I know that um, many men have been treated very poorly and abused and, and, and I've seen it. So I don't, I don't attribute this to being a problem that one sex has towards another. It is, I think it's a problem that we all tend to share and that we all need to take responsibility for because I believe that women can be just as aggressive and abusive as men can be, and I've seen it. And so I'm not faulting either sex. I just feel that there needs to be more said about this. Sadly, 18% of female victims who were raped by their spouse say that their children witnessed the crime. More than 15 million children in the United States live in homes in which domestic violence has happened at least once, and these children are at greater risk for repeating the cycle as adults by entering into abusive relationships or becoming abusers themselves. And this is why I am sympathetic to um, men who I would meet who were charged and, and many times convicted for violent sexual assault because oftentimes there was stories where they were violated so severely as children. It's shocking what people have been through as children that no one would hear them or validate or get them the appropriate help. And spiritually, we see how people fracture when they are sexually violated, but little children, it is deafening what happens. So there, there is a much needed um, solution for this at all levels, but if you have a child who is being molested sexually, there is no other acceptable response except to get them every level of help possible. Because they grow up at risk of being battered or being a batterer. It is a very big risk to set them up for. A boy who sees his mother being abused is 10 times more likely to abuse his partner as an adult. A girl who grows up in a home where her father abuses her mother is more than six times as likely to be sexually abused as a girl who grows up in a non-abusive home. Children who witness or are victims of emotional, physical, or sexual abuse are at a higher risk for health problems as adults, which includes mental health conditions, depression, anxiety. They also are at high risk for diabetes, obese, diabetes, obesity, heart disease, poor self-esteem, and other problems that become very severe and life crippling. 10 to 14% of married women will be raped at some point during, during their marriage. And marital rape is the most underreported form of sexual assault. Only 36% of all rape victims ever report that crime to the police. The percentage of married women who report spousal rape to the police is even lower. Before 1976, state laws exempted spousal rape from their general rape laws. However, in 1976, Nebraska became the first state to pass a law recognizing non-consensual intercourse with a spouse as rape. And in, by 1993, all 50 states had either completely or partially repealed repealed their spousal rape exemptions. However, there are a few states that continue to have some form of spousal rape exemptions. Some states legally consider it a lesser crime than non-spousal non -spousal rape. 
Unfortunately, many Americans do not believe marital rape is actually rape. The law does say otherwise now. To understand why domestic and family violence is a problem in our churches, we have to be willing to talk about it. And in the Bible, all violence is considered an offense against God and humanity. And the Bible is full of condemnation for violence. Time and time again, violence is associated with wickedness and condemned as detestable to the Lord. In particular, violence against women is condemned. In Jewish law, rape was viewed as equivalent to murder, as was pressuring a woman physically or psychologically into sex. The Bible recounts many stories of horrific sexual abuse of women. In the Old Testament, it talks rape is viewed as an outrage, a term nebula. It's only used 13 times in the Old Testament and is reserved for extreme acts of violation against God and human beings, including the rapes of Dinah, Tamar, and the woman of Bethlehem. You won't see the word abuse in the Bible, but you will see the term oppression, which is defined biblically as the crushing or burdening someone by the abuse of power or authority. And it's all through the Bible. Psalms in particular, First Psalms portrays oppression in a manner that echoes the way abuse survivors describe their abuser. Psalm 10, his mouth, is full with cursing and deceit and oppression under his tongue are mischief and iniquity. Psalm 56, God is on the side of the oppressed and the abused. Jesus refuses to play by the rules of violence and power. He himself modeled that the powerful should give up their privilege to the vulnerable. The abuser should stop using violence against those powerless to resist and the institution should stop ignoring the trauma of the survivors. The way of Jesus calls us to relationships that are nonviolent. We are to resist using violence, even in retaliation for violence used against us. Abuse and oppression of the vulnerable by the powerful is sadly very prevalent in our world, and men's violence against women is well documented throughout the Bible. The underlying driver of violence is the need to find some recognized level of power in how we see ourselves and our place in the world. And people in powerful positions are anxious about that power. And the acquisition of power is a never ending process as those who achieve any level of power quickly become accustomed to it. And it becomes a status quo that they have to keep having more power and more power. And the only way that can be fulfilled is by acquiring more power. And for an abuser, the belief that they have an inherent right to power and the threat of the potential loss of their personal power, that fuels violence. The abuser typically views marriage as a pyramid of power with themselves on the top and they're constantly trying to secure that position. And this is why abusers are controlling, they're easily angered, critical, and why they isolate their spouses from their family and friends but God uses power very differently. The relationships authored by God are self-giving and use power that is shared and transformative, the very opposite of authoritarian and abusive power. When God made us in his image, he shared some of his creative power with us as he commissioned us to fill the earth. And this power has a particular character. It enables human flourishing. Philippians 2 tells how despite being God, Jesus made himself nothing by taking the status of a servant. On the cross, he set aside his power. He humbled himself completely for us and for his father. And these were his words to his disciples. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Matthew 20, 26 to 28. Only when power is used to enhance someone else's freedom is it being used well. 
humility, gentleness, and sacrificing self for others, this is how Jesus operates. Jesus does not ever strive for power or scramble to hold power. He does not use power to dominate or coerce. He dismantles these systems of domination. And his life provides the alternative, peace, nonviolence, caretaking, and connection. And Jesus, like leaders, use their, po their position to ensure that power is used fairly within their sphere. Men in the church who want to truly model the self-sacrificial love of Jesus will actively invite the voice of women, seek the development of women's giftings, anticipate and prioritize women's needs, and pursue a culture in which women's contributions are valued as highly as men's. Justice and mercy lie at the very heart of God's character, and when God introduces himself, justice is a key trait. Jeremiah 9:24, I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on the earth, for in these I delight. God hates evil. He judges and punishes evildoers, and there will come a day and a time when all of those who refuse to abandon violence, who silence the wounded, who would not embrace the truth and justice, God condemns that. We do not need to take revenge for that because God himself is going to punish them. He is going to hold them accountable. God will bring into judgment the righteous and the wicked, for there will be a time for every activity, a time to judge every deed. Ecclesiastes 3.17 Hebrews 10.30 and Romans 12.19 all support that. And it could not be clearer that God hates violence and abuse within families and relationships. Loving justice and acting justly means refusing to tolerate abuse. You expose it and you stop it. Many acts of domestic and family violence are against the law. We can and should embrace the God-given authorities of human government and law enforcement to stop this abuse and bring abusers to justice. If you know that this is happening and you don't do anything, you are enabling the abuser. According to the Bible, the actions of an emotional abuser are sinful and not pleasing to God. The famous passage about love in 1 Corinthians 13 makes it obvious that emotional abuse is wrong. The Apostle Paul describes the actions of real love. He says love is patient, it's kind, and emotional abuse is neither patient nor kind. But instead it's quick to flare up at small offenses. It says in verse 5, love keeps no record of wrongs, but emotional abuse is all about pointing out how another person has wronged in everything he does so as to protect the ego of the abuser. Love is not rude or selfish or prideful or irritable or resentful, all unfortunate qualities of emotional abuse. Instead, love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres, according to verse 7. Sadly, it is the loving person, the one who loves unconditionally, who is often the target of emotional abuse. And according to the Bible's definition of love, should an emotional abuser be tolerated? Does love require that one overlooks the abuse and persevere through all that pain? The answer is no. There are loving options other than tolerating the status of an abuser. Abuse is a learned behavior, and if we allow it to, if we allow it to happen and continue, we are accepting it. Therefore, we are helping it. We cannot and should not accept verbal or emotional abuse for two reasons. It dishonors the Lord and it often escalates to physical abuse. So it needs to be stopped by those who are enabling it. Abusing someone emotionally is not the behavior of a person walking in fellowship with Jesus Christ. How does a relationship deteriorate to the point of emotional abuse? Somewhere along the way, a failure to obey God's commands regarding relationships has happened. It takes two people to make a relationship. Each side is to have their own fellowship with God through Christ and actively be choosing to honor God and others. And without that fellowship with God and without that commitment to honoring others, there's going to be a relationship breakdown. That's how abuse happens. 
it starts out with a breakdown in the relationship with God. Any relationship plagued by emotional abuse will eventually have to choose one of three paths. Either the abuser admits their fault, sees their behavior as harmful and changes, or two, the abused person walks away, at least temporarily, or three, the abuse is allowed to continue indefinitely to harm both parties and often many more, including children, permanently. The abuser will only find healing and forgiveness through genuine repentance and calling on the Lord. 2 Corinthians 7.10 says that godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. The difference between godly grief and worldly grief is repentance. A person who truly understands the nature of their sin will be able to feel grief that leads to repentance and salvation and a cleared up conscience. We can't make choices for someone else, but we certainly can stop them from emotional abuse. And that is a choice that the abuser must make, but the person that's being abused also needs to make a choice. We can refuse to accept the abuse. The most extreme cure for emotional abuse is separation. A separation from the abuser allows time for that abuser to seek godly counsel from a pastor or a biblical counselor so that the spiritual balance can be reintroduced into the relationship. Reconciliation can occur if that's done the right way. Regardless of the choices that the abuser makes, we can make the choice to obey God and honor him with our lives and accepting the abuse is not the way to go. Refusing to tolerate the abuse while maintaining a calm spiritual demeanor and without displaying contentiousness will go a long way towards diffusing a volatile situation. I am one who has had to completely separate myself from people in recent years after repeatedly asking for behavior to stop that was causing me great harm that went unheard. These are people who have high ministry positions who refuse to hear and I've had to make a lot of changes in my life because of that. I was not valued or cared about in those settings. So this is a really current situation for me. And I have had to make a lot of decisions to protect myself, to keep my health. And I am one who can speak about this from personal experience again, that I am very disillusioned by positions of power who use that position to harm rather than lift up. Verbal abuse is one weapon in the arsenal of emotional abuse, and while the tax tactics of abuse are many, the ultimate goal is to gain control over someone in order to establish dominance in that relationship. And that is probably what happened in my case, was the intimidation is shocking to me, the level people will go to intimidate to try to get control of something. Verbal abuse is not the occasional flare after a bad day or temporary lack of self-control in the midst of a tense moment. It constitutes psychological violence. Verbal abuse is a habitual sin that seldom goes away on its own and it very easily can escalate into physical abuse. Overt verbal abuse could include angry outbursts, screaming, swearing, ridicule, name-calling, blaming, accusation, criticism, threats, orders, mocking, manipulation, coercion, put-downs, shaming, word-twisting, rewriting history, and attacking people's character. 
covert verbal abuse is more subtle and cloaks hidden aggression. It acts like it's concerned and it has the effect of brainwashing, leaving the victim confused, off balance, and questioning their own values or abilities. And over the long term, any kind of abuse leaves the victim feeling uncertain, unable to make decisions, and drained of any sense of value. This victim begins to accept the blame and believe the crushing words that have been repeatedly thrown at them. Abusive language has a deep, long-lasting effect that pierces like swords, according to Proverbs 12:18. The words we speak reflect what is going on inside of us. Luke 6:45 says, a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, but an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Words affect the speaker as well as the receiver. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. James 3, 6, and 9. Matthew 5, 21 to 22 categorizes verbal abuse as a serious offense with eternal consequences. It says, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, which is an Aramaic term of contempt, meaning worthless, empty, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. God's heart on the subject of how we use our words is very evident in the Bible, and there's no question about the seriousness of the effects on the hearer or the speaker of violent and abusive words. You can tell an abuser. You can tell an abuser. They flatter a lot. They flatter. And so you end up with two things. You end up with this stern, manipulative, controlling behavior, or you have flattery when they realize you've kind of, you're not taking that anymore. Then it turns into this other thing. You can tell an abuser because they, a person who is not, has no need to flatter. The flattery, in my opinion, comes out of the same mouth as the abuser. In my opinion, in my opinion and in my experience, the abusers were also flatterers, both things. But one thing I never heard from them was responsibility taken for what they said or what has caused harm. No, I'm sorry. They don't say those things, but they'll flatter you and tell you how amazing you are but they won't say that they've done you wrong or that they're sorry. When the words of others have hurt us, we can find healing in the true words of God. When we have hurt others with our words, we can find forgiveness in God, but we also need to make it right with those that we have harmed. And those who have been victims of serious verbal abuse, it's very possible you're going to need some help to heal. I am all for counselors and pastors being used in that role to help people heal from the verbal and emotional damage that's been done to them by other people. I have had to get a great deal of that myself. God's desire is that we encourage one another and build each other up, 1 Thessalonians 5.11, and that we do not let any unwholesome talk come out of our mouths, but only that which is helpful for building others up according to their needs, Ephesians 4.29. God intends that our words and our relationships are healthy and life-giving. Keep in mind, he created the universe with his words. Jesus himself is called the word of God, and his desire is that we recognize the power that our words have and that we use them to build life. When Paul says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church in Ephesians 5.25, he categorically is prohibiting every attitude or behavior that results in a husband devaluing, humiliating, belittling, or emotionally or physically wounding his wife. It's condemned. 
whatever Paul meant when he told wives to submit to their husbands as unto the Lord, in Ephesians 5.22, he was categorically not saying that women should never live in fear of their husbands, that he's saying women should not ever live in fear of their husbands, and he certainly is not supporting the idea that men and women are created unequal, that women are to be treated inferior. He is not saying that. For some, submission is good, and it's an important part for all in marriage. It is good and important. In fact, that both submit to each other is an absolutely impressive marriage. But it can become very problematic when one pulls power in that word. They want submissive behavior as a power pull. It's then oppressive to the other one. It becomes an oppressive marriage. And there's evidence that an emphasis in some churches in their doctrine has a headship type view of that that can foster a climate that enables men to have power over the women, causes a very unhealthy power dynamic, and it causes women and children to feel very unsafe inside that home. Remaining in an abusive relationship, even under that kind of a doctrine, is not supported by the Bible. Marriage is not meant to induce suffering and enduring persistent abuse that never leads to anything good. Ongoing abuse in a marriage is damaging to everyone. The abuser is not made accountable and only becomes further ingrained in their sin and their beliefs that are wrong. The victim's emotional and physical well-being are corroded. The children of the marriage are damaged by this dysfunctional modeling that they receive as well as the fear, the secrecy, and the denial that goes with it. And then they grow up to be very confused and by default having a lot of trouble in their own relationships. It's very hard for them to function inside a relationship because they have been taught as a child to do it wrong. Biblically, suffering does not have any redemptive value in and of itself. The Gospels often recount times when during his ministry, Jesus avoids or escapes likely violence and encourages his disciples to do the same. And even Jesus asked God to take the cup of suffering from him in the Garden of Gethsemane. So if a victim can avoid suffering by leaving a dangerous relationship, they definitely should do that. And the church needs to support them to do so. There's nothing in the Bible to support the view that it's God's will for people to endure relational abuse. The Bible is clear that violence is evil and it needs to be confronted. Jesus tell us, tells us we need to bring the evil into light. We're to rebuke the wrongdoers, seek justice, and hold them accountable. Yet within church communities, victims of relationship abuse often feel pressured that they have to hold their marriage together no matter the cost no matter how the abuser mistreats them. And it's all too common for Christians to use the phrase, God hates divorce, to prevent victims of abuse from leaving their abusers. If committing violence against one who is supposed to be one flesh is not a violation of God's intention for marriage as a faithful one flesh union, I don't know what is. The Christian community and its leaders should not be heard to be insisting that a person suffering physical or emotional abuse has to stay in the relationship to be further victimized. Church communities should model God's compassion by offering support wholeheartedly to anyone who is trying to escape an abusive relationship. Repentance is a biblical term that describes the deep sorrow of recognizing our sin and wanting to turn away from it according to God. According to his standards, it involves a confession of wrongdoing, naming the sin, and recognizing responsibility for it. It also involves grief at our wrong behavior, recognizing the limits of our ability to make amends, and acknowledging its impact on our relationships with God and with others. In addition to this, it involves a change of heart, deciding that the future will involve new plans, new ways of behaving, and then acting on that. 
Repentance does not lead, that does not lead to a behavior change is not repentance at all. Godly sorrow always produces a genuine concern to ensure that change happens. Because repentance is a gift from God, it is also possible for perpetrators of domestic and family violence to repent. God can certainly bring repentance. The Holy Spirit can convict them of their abusive attitudes and behaviors and definitely help them to change. However, for repentance to be genuine, it must involve a very honest confession, genuine attempts at restitution, willingness to be held accountable by church leaders, and sustain changes in attitude and behavior. However, there is no biblical obligation for victims to reconcile with abusers, none. Victims should never be compelled to participate in the repentance process either. They should not be asked to help the abuser repent or certify their repentance. They should not be encouraged to restore the relationship to its previous state ever. Although God can do miracles in helping an abuser re realize their wrongdoing, changing their patterns of behavior does take a long time and it requires an abuser to investigate deeply how they develop those patterns, often way back to childhood. John the Baptist told the Pharisees and the Sadducees who were outwardly moral but inwardly deceitful to bear fruits worthy of repentance in Matthew 3.8. Abusers must be encouraged to continual and ongoing repentance and not to rely on their initial guilty feelings alone. During the repentance process, churches should always be alert to sham repentance, which is a key feature of the cycle of violence and abusive relationships. And that's when the person recognizes I'm about to lose this person and they suddenly are full of remorse and sorrow but most of us who have watched these cycles of abuse see that is a very short-lived cycle until they feel secure in that relationship and they've managed to keep that person there. Churches should always be watchful for that. Forgiveness is one of the core expectations of the Christian faith and it's vital to who we are as believers. However, the doctrine of forgiveness is often misused to pressure victims back into an abusive relationship without adequate consequences and accountability from the abuser. Victims are never called to submit to domestic violence and they are not called to endure in silence. The Bible never sanctifies avoidable suffering. Jesus was sacrificially selfless, but he was not a victim. He repeatedly escaped from situations where he would have been physically assaulted by Jewish authorities. And both King David and the Apostle Paul repeatedly fled physical abusive situations. The only kind of abuse the Bible recognizes as redemptive is that which is unavoidable and results from the victim's godly character. 1 Peter 1. Superficial understandings of forgiveness can do enormous harm to victims. Too many times Christians have been asked to reinstate their abusive partner to their former role after forgiving them. And this has put the victim right back in harm's way and the abuser right back in power. Churches should never use the biblical call to forgiveness to encourage someone to return to a situation where they are at risk for more abuse. Paul used the word reconciliation to describe the ending of hostility in a relationship. Reconciliation in an abusive marriage can only ever occur once the abuser has stopped their violence and done whatever is necessary to not return to the abusive patterns of the past. The pattern of forgiveness in Luke 17, three through four makes it clear that forgiveness is a process that always holds an, ab an abuser accountable for their actions always moving forward. This may take the form of legal consequences. It may mean um, disillusion of their relationship. It must also involve repentance and restitution. Even if repentance has truly occurred, reconciliation might not be appropriate and will certainly require boundaries and expectations. It is entirely possible that the relationship may never recover. Again, this is personal for me. 
I never imagined at this point in my life that I would be having to set the kind of boundaries that I'm having to set. And making decisions about things that at this point in my life I will not revisit. The Bible says God hates abuse. He views it as sinful and unacceptable, but he delights in rescuing the oppressed. 2 Samuel 22, 49. This testimony isn't always easy for us to believe, but in daily life, we often, if somebody is an abuse, suffering abuse, they struggle to see how God can work good out of it, but I promise you God can. I promise you. God can work great good out of it. Jesus' ministry bears this out. He heals the sick. He seeks out and welcomes the excluded. He notices and cares for the lowly. Healing is a key part of Jesus' ministry and the kingdom of God. And I guarantee, had I not been through these things, I would be a different person and I would not be caring about the people that are most important to me now. I surrendered my pain to Jesus. I have no desire to carry around a load of anger and hatred and resentment. I don't need it. I don't have room for it. But it has changed how I operate in almost every way in ministry. I never, ever want to become that way. I want to be someone who always builds, always lifts up. Despite how it may seem, God is not standing around letting the evil run its course. He will not allow evil to have the final word and there will be a reckoning. When the darkness will not lift, there is hope because God knows and he will respond to evil with justice, redemption, and renewal. And you can trust that God will direct our emotional healing in a wise and timely way. Know that his promises are true, and because his promises are true, there's always hope. I want to make sure that people know that I am always a safe and confidential person to talk to, and I sharing um, this ministry with Shaylee and Tatiana, I know the same about them, that they both have experienced significant trauma from abuse and definitely can feel when people, we can feel, we can feel people when they talk about that. Sometimes it's just, you need a friend. And we, are always willing to be that friend. We are always willing to be that safe place. We don't always know the answer and we won't make decisions for you, but we are someone who will be a safe place for you. And we don't just say for women because we know from our own lives that there are men that are not safe either. So it's, it's equal for us that we, we don't blame men and we don't blame women, but we know that men and women both feel unsafe. So I pray, God, that you help us, especially as a family of God, to not be abusers. I pray that you would make it so clear to those of us who proclaim to be followers of Jesus Christ, that we watch carefully what comes out of our mouths. That we carefully watch what we communicate to other people with our words. that we don't ever become the people that take much needed hope in these hard days. I ask 
that you start with the church, that you start with the church, and that you help the church to get this right from the top down, that women and children and men will be safe, safe emotionally, safe physically. I ask that you work miracles within the church that there would no be, not be victimization at any level going on within the church or the followers of Jesus first. Help us, God, to be a safe place for the world where they're looking to come out of danger, that they would actually have a safe place to go, the church. Help us to stay loving and full of forgiveness for those who have caused us harm, God. Here we just release all of that to you and we bless those who have harmed us. We bless them, God, and we ask that you would bless them. You would bless them so powerfully that they would be just drowning in favor from you. We bless those who have hurt us because we want them to do well. We don't want them angry. We don't want them, we, we want no ought. So help us, Jesus, to be the bright light on a hill, to set the example, to be the very best that we can be for you and that we would be the safe place that you want us to be. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.